Live from the slightly twisted deck bar, it's the Poojie Podcast with Justin Lameen. The Poojie Podcast is proudly sponsored by Cimarron Golf Club, located in Jacksonville, Florida, off County Road 210, just west of St. John's Parkway. What is going on, everybody? It is Wednesday, August 19th, and I'm here in the clubhouse of the Jacksonville Jumbo Shrimp. I'm, unfortunately, it is raining cats and dogs outside, so not able to record outside, unfortunately. Uh, but here we are in nice, warm shelter, and I'm excited for this episode. Great guest coming up, uh, interview number 37. But first, I want to talk about a few things happening in the world of sports. So let's talk about it. Both in football and baseball, some major stories kind of formulating. Most recently, this uh, past weekend, the SEC dropped their football schedule, uh, kind of raising the hopes of a lot of the fans around the country. And when it comes to SEC football, I kind of like to view them as the NFL of professional sports. The SEC is to college football what the NFL is to professional sports, where they just always seem too big to fail. And the fact that so many other conferences want them to fail means that they will take any action it takes to get this season played. And I think that's what's going to happen now on the schedule for the Gators and the Bulldogs, of course. They have a game here in Jacksonville, Florida. Are there going to be fans, world's largest cocktail party? Who knows what's going to happen there? But at least what we know now is that football is planning on being played. The date can keep getting pushed back, which might frustrate a lot of people. But to be honest with you, I'd much rather be in this situation as an SEC fan or a Big 12 fan or an ACC fan or an American Conference fan holding out hope that we might have football this fall. I know football means so many things to so many people. And it's part of the daily lives of, of a lot of people around this country in the fall. So holding out this hope is a lot better than knowing that there's no chance at all. And let's be real. Is it realistic to play a full season in the spring? I don't think so. It doesn't make sense putting that wear on these young kids' bodies. And if the overall concern is for the health of the players, I don't think that the players should really look to suit up and play coming up in the spring. That doesn't make too much sense. So for now, we're holding out hope in college football. I think the SEC is going to find a way to make it happen. I know the ACC kind of retracted their one non-conference game since the SEC stuck to their guns with just conference games. So we'll see what happens. Uh, I know some of the other schools are announcing their schedules, but who knows? I'm excited. Uh, Hopefully we get some played. And then on the other side of professional sports in baseball, a sport that is currently being played, one of the hottest young all-stars, superstar talents in the league, Fernando Tatis Jr. with the Padres uh, sparked some controversy uh, this weekend, hitting a grand slam in the eighth inning when the team was already up seven runs. A lot of controversy behind this. Uh, I don't know why. Are you going to tell these young players to stop swinging the bat? Are you going to tell them to walk up into the batter's box and tell the umpire that you're out? Are you supposed to take yourself off the field and get out of there to just make the other team feel better about an embarrassing loss? I don't like that. Uh, Famous coach Bill Parcells uh, back in the day, and I know Steve Sperrier has said stuff like it as well, said, I wasn't hired as the head coach of my team to play defense against my own team. If you don't want us to score, figure out a way to stop us. And I think that's how it needs to be in baseball. Fernando Tatis then ended up rubbing some salt in the wound the very next day, stealing third uh, late in the game. Uh, He was safe at third after a booth review and was just kind of a funny way uh, of him to just show up the Texas Rangers. And I know he got a lot of support uh, from a lot of the players and from a lot of people online, uh, one being Trevor Bauer, someone that was very vocal about it, saying, hey, man, you do you, you're young, you're playing for a contract in the future, uh, so I have no problem with it. And the unwritten rules in baseball are not written down for a reason, so throw them in the trash. If they were written rules, the league would enforce them, and people wouldn't have a problem. But they aren't written rules, so let these kids, especially these young kids that are trying to make a name for themselves, get that fandom, let them do what they want, But I do want to bring someone in right now, uh, a Big Brother fan that's going to be talking some Big Brother. But real quick, Matt Maynard, do you have anything to say on that that topic with Fernando Tatis or potentially even SEC football, just college football in general? Yeah, I mean, I'm looking forward to hopefully college football coming back. I know I've seen a lot of hype about the uh, ACC and the SEC, uh, the Big 12 as well coming back. And I talk about the American Conference, Uh, you know. It is what it is, you know. We're hoping uh, we get some football back, um, just like what uh, I think what Nick Saban and Steve Sarkeesian said at the SEC. It's almost like close to a prep as the NFL. Um, you're gonna get ten quality opponents all year, and the same with the SEC on uh, the Big Twelve. You can say the American Conference. You're gonna have ten, eleven quality opponents that you pretty much should be playing every single year. So, 
I'm looking forward to it. Hopefully it happens. So, uh, but let's say we'll see what happens from there. And as for uh, Fernando Tatis, uh, it's a, it, if you're upset about someone hitting a three zero count, then throw a better pitch. I'm sorry. I mean, you know, you're already, you're already down by a lot. And it just shows what kind of team you are that you're that upset about it. And I said, Fernando Tatis is an all-star, you know, he shouldn't be apologizing for hitting a, a 3-0 pitch that ends up being a grand slam. You know what? Let, let the, like, like they said, let the kids play. It's baseball. And if you're upset at him swinging on a 3-0 count, how about you don't let the count get to 3-0? Let's start there. Maybe, maybe you got to look at yourself in the mirror. But uh, anyways, we digress. Uh, in the Big Brother world, I know we've kind of kept updated on Big Brother, and today is Wednesday, so power of veto competition tonight. What are you looking for tonight? What have you thought so far? Just briefly a minute or so. Uh, you know, it's definitely uh, what I anticipate with Big Brother already. Um, you know, alliances are already formed. We're already seeing some uh, hot seats already going on. Uh, Memphis, interesting how he's handling the head of household. This is his first time. We'll give him credit for that. But telling everybody uh, to immediately use the safety suite and then one person not using it, uh, Nicole Anthony, and he already puts her on the block because of that. Um, Kristen is winning the, the uh, safety suite competition using Ian as her plus one. I think that's who Memphis was targeting. Memphis is a little upset, but, uh, again, he can't be mad at his own alliance. Tonight, uh, it's going to be interesting as uh, I think David is going to pull it out to win the veto competition. I know David's on the high seat right now. Um, that's because he's the rookie, as Memphis said. So let's see how he handles all the pressure, and uh, I think he's going to pull it out. Yeah, it'll be, it'll be interesting to see what happens this evening. Uh, I don't think – uh, Memphis can be upset at Christmas. Christmas didn't know the plans. For those that don't know what the safety suite is, just that room that uh, house guests can earn an advantage to stay safe with a plus one in the first few weeks of the game. And Ian ended up being Christmas's plus one, a huge target for Memphis. He was trying to get out of the game. But that's our Big Brother update, quick Big Brother update. And if you stay tuned for after the interview, uh, be sure to stick around for the Puji Parlay presented by Shores Pub Mandarin. But here we are, uh, episode 37, interview 37, uh, presented by Strings Sports Brewery right there in North Jacks, just north of downtown on Main Street, a great spot with all the sports going on. Definitely be sure to check it out. And the hockey playoffs going on, the NBA playoffs going on, baseball around midseason now, and hopefully, like we've mentioned, football comes back soon. Strings is the place to be so uh, definitely go check them out but enjoy this interview I have a very special guest uh, the Saint, uh, Saint Los Angeles Rams excuse me Los Angeles Rams special teams coordinator coach John Bonamego he's had a great storied career within football uh, he's got a lot of cool insight on uh, the COVID testing, hard knocks being there in Los Angeles with both the Rams and the Chargers. Uh, so definitely take a listen to what he has to say and uh, definitely look forward to sticking around for the Puji Parlay segment of the show afterwards. So uh, for now, sit back and enjoy. Thanks. Yes, indeed. Thank you to Strings Sports Brewery for supporting the podcast right here in Jacksonville, Florida, just north of downtown on Main Street. I know I shout them out a lot, but they do a great job over there, especially with sports coming back a great place to go and enjoy some great food, great beer, and great sports as well. Just an awesome environment over there, as well as Cimarron Golf Club for uh, always doing great work over there off County Road 210. Uh, but I am excited for this interview today. Uh, a guy that I met a while back um, when I was still in high school, someone that's been kind enough to keep in touch with me and, and, and answer my texts and emails when, when I reach out to him, someone that's just been, been a really good mentor for me as I've approached my a career in sports uh, where I'm at now and uh, I do want to welcome on coach John Bonamego the special teams coordinator coordinator for the Los Angeles Rams so thanks for being here John. Thank you for having me Justin and I'm proud of you and everything that you've accomplished and I'm excited to continue to watch you uh, grow in your field and you know the sky's the limit man I'm, I'm really proud of you I want you to know that right from the get-go and Appreciate thanks for it. thanks for reaching out and thanks for having me on. For sure. No, I appreciate those words. Thank you for saying that, of course, and uh, definitely means a lot. It's been, you've been a great help. I know I've, I've asked you multiple times different questions about the sports industry, so I definitely appreciate it. Uh, but I do want to get started. How's, uh, how have things been? I know you're in L.A. now. Uh, how, how's the offseason been uh, kind of getting ready for this uh, unconventional season, if you will? Well, it's been a challenge, and I think the challenges will continue to come. You know, I think that uh, times like this, it's very important to, you know, be flexible. Uh, you know, one of, the, one, of the, one of the things I've always lived by is, you, you know, you have a plan, you work your plan, but you, but you have to stay flexible. And certainly that's 
been the case thus far. And it'll, you know, there, it will continue to have uh, challenges, you know, arise that we'll have to adjust to. And, and that's going to be the name of the game. And uh, this season more so than ever, um, I think the, che- the teams that will handle that the best will be the ones that uh, will have an advantage once we start playing games. Yeah, and I know a lot of coaches within sports always talk about adversity, and this is just another one of those massive adversity hurdles to get over for a lot of teams going through these various uh, Zoom meetings, different you know unconventional ways of getting in touch with players and other coaches, things like that. But from your standpoint, and I guess within the NFL, to the extent that you're able to answer, is there a pretty high level of confidence that this season is going to be able to get off without a hitch and and that we're going to get through a a 2020 NFL season? Yeah, I really do. I really believe that that uh, that it will and that that everything will go on as planned. I think, you know, at at work, I feel very safe. You know, everyone around us is uh, being tested every day. you know, even on an off day like today for the players, they're still required to come in and test. You know, they clean the facility, uh, you know, every couple hours they're, they're coming through and disinfecting. You know, we've moved our meetings are, are primarily outside in a tented area that, you know, we saw that uh, we covered up part of our parking lot, put down turf. And I think uh, if anybody's watched Hard Knocks, they would see what that look, looks like. And the idea there is that now being outdoors with a lot of airflow, it definitely, it dramatically reduces the, uh, you know, the chances or the likelihood that would be infected, you know, anybody could be infected. So, uh, you know, I feel safe. Uh, I'm sure our players do. And, uh, you know, it's really when we step outside of our ecosystem, that's probably when we're at most risk and you know myself personally I don't go too many places I pretty much beeline it straight home and uh, it's you know home in the office this time of year so feel good yeah that seems to be the overall consensus just you know holding each other accountable making sure people are doing the right things to make sure the season gets off without a hitch so I'm happy you mentioned that and, and just recently earlier this week um, you know college football has had some issues but the NFL operates at a completely different level Um, You know, all teams under one shield, if you will, with the NFL shield. Um, So I'm excited for the NFL, just for the sake of sanity, for the NFL to come back and and play. I know us as fans, we're excited. But being here in Jacksonville, just about 300, 400 yards that way, um, what used to be called Altel Stadium when you were coaching there, your first NFL coaching stop here in Jacksonville. Tell me a little bit about that and, and maybe some of the people that were around you that you've held connections with. And uh, just just your time here in Jacksonville for the uh, Jaguar fans that might be listening. Well, you know, I was very, very fortunate. I've been very blessed. And, you know, for us to be able to do what we do, uh, every single day is a blessing. Um, I was blessed to have had an opportunity or been given an opportunity by Coach Coughlin, uh, someone who I hadn't met until I interviewed uh, with him, you know, gave me uh, an opportunity to come to, to Jacksonville as the assistant special teams coach. And it really, you know, to say it changed my life, impacted my life would be a huge understatement. I mean, I've met, I met Paulette, my wife uh, there in Jacksonville, uh, had an opportunity to come back again and work on, on uh, Coach Malarkey's staff. That's when you and I met. So, um, you know, Jacksonville's home, you know, that's where Paulette was born and raised. Two of our three children were born there. Uh, myself, you know, I'm not, ne- I'm not necessarily from there. Uh, I was kind of, a, I was an army brat. So my dad was in the service. So we moved around a lot, but, you know, uh, Paulette's family's there. You know, we, we, we still own a place there in Jacksonville beach and uh, we try to get back there as often as we can. So, you know, uh, that franchise and the city will, will always hold a special place for me uh, just because so many great things happened there for me. That's awesome. Yeah, I know uh, you've kind of told me some of those same things, and, and thanks for sharing that on here. And I know you've had a great journey, and I know you played football at Central Michigan uh, University. You had the chance to, to actually get your first head coaching gig there at Central Michigan, so I'm sure that had to be a surreal moment for you being able to go back to your alma mater um, within your coaching, uh, the coaching line that you've been on. 
Uh, but you did mention something earlier about Hard Knocks being in the facilities. What's that been like? Uh, have you experienced anything like that within your coaching career as far as? No, no it's, the, it's the first time. Um, honestly, they do such a good job of kind of staying out of the way and in the background. You, you know, once you get rolling, you really, you don't, you don't, you don't even realize that they're there. Um, I saw a thing on the paper a couple of days ago, Les Snead, our GM, compared them to the, the Navy SEALs, and it made me chuckle. I think that's a, that's a pretty good, accurate description. I mean, they're very stealthy. They use, they use uh, you know, you see drones flying around every once in a while, but they're very careful to kind of stay in the background, stay out of the way, and it's uh, not intrusive. Like I said, you, you really kind of lose track and forget that they're there, which is a good thing. And, I think could potentially could be a bad thing too. So, you gonna get any uh, any airtime? You're gonna make any uh, television sets? I have no no clue. I really have no idea. Uh, you know, I mean, this is my first year here in LA with this team, and without having the off season, um, you know, my greatest challenge is really uh, getting to know uh, these players. You know, who they are, what they can do. Um, how they learn, um, you know, what what skill sets they may each individually have, or or in more importantly, what what they don't have, uh, you know, to try to do the very best job I can to piece together, um, you know, a special teams unit that can go out and 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 play good football. And I mean, this has to be one of the most talented special teams groups that you've had the chance to be a part of. I know uh, punter Johnny Hecker is there. He's a Pro Bowl punter. Um, Jake McQuaid, the long snapper, I know he's been there for a while too. Uh, some, some good chemistry between them two. And is, uh, is, it, is Greg Zerline still the kicker there? I mean, the three of them, they have some great chemistry. Is it still him? Well, it would be if, if, uh, if Zerline was here. Zerline's in Dallas now, so we've got actually three. Oh, really? Yeah, we have three young the kicking jobs open. We have three young kickers on the roster that we're uh, going to put, uh, you know, put pressure on and put under, you know, put them through the paces and see, you know, who comes out. We've got you know, Hiram Hirula, Liram Hirulahu, who uh, kicked in the uh, uh, the CFL for quite a while. Um, you know, he, he's in camp. We drafted a young man out of uh, Miami of Ohio by the name of Sam Sloman. And then uh, we have another talented kicker from University of Kentucky who played in the AFL and, uh, and also the uh, XFL in, in Austin McGinnis. So, you know, we're going to let those three guys kind of slug it out and see who, you know, who, who comes out of camp as the, can win the job but um, that's the biggest part we also have to you know we also have to figure out who our returners are going to be um, they had Jojo Nats in here a year ago he's no longer on the squad so you know there'll be competition at those uh, positions there as well so we've we've got our uh, work cut out for us a lot of a lot of work to do you know but again we want to be able to compete at a consistently at a high level week in and week out Awesome. My, uh, my apologies there on that slip on Zerline. I must have missed that oh, he, had, he had moved over to good. Dallas. So uh, my, my apologies there. But please tell me, Johnny Hecker's still there. There, Did I get yeah. that right? Hecker's here and McQuaid's here. It's a little, Johnny, it's a, uh, Johnny Hecker actually gave my buddy a NFC Pro Bowl hat back when the uh, Pro Bowl was in Orlando a few years ago. Uh, had a really good conversation, relationship with them just at the Pro Bowl. Was a really cool guy to, to kind of hang around and see them do some pretty fun things on the field. I think it was him, Marquette King, and there was one other guy there. They had a really fun time doing some cool stuff, uh, punting uh, with the, the football at the Pro Bowl. But I appreciate, uh, I appreciate you jumping on here. I don't have anything else for you. I know you're busy getting ready for, for uh, you know, players to, to come back into the facilities tomorrow and everything. Uh, but I appreciate you taking this time to jump on here and, and definitely hope to keep in touch with you uh, as the season approaches and, and beyond. For sure. You got it. Thanks, Justin. All right. Thanks, Coach. Have a good one. Okay. Take
Again, thank you to String Sports Brewery for bringing you that interview. Uh, they do a great job there. Again, I can't talk enough about them. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Coach Bono, uh, a great mentor of mine, someone that has uh, done a lot for me just in terms of my growth within uh, the industry and just someone that's been so nice to keep in touch with no matter where he's been within his coaching career. So hope you got some insight and definitely look forward to keeping in touch with Coach Bono for future episodes. But you might be wondering, Justin, it's raining outside. Why are you so happy? Well, here's why I'm so happy. The Lightning were down 4-2 in the third period, fall all the way back, scored the game-tying goal with a minute left, and then won within the first minute of overtime. Lightning win the series, avenge that 0-4 sweep from last season against the same team, the Columbus Blue Jackets. Uh, they, they get rid of that that cloud that was hanging over their head, the team that can never finish uh, in the playoffs. Hopefully they can continue moving on in the playoffs, but that's why I'm so happy because playoff hockey is happening. My team just finished out the series in five games and I was nervous. If Columbus had won game five, I was a little bit nervous that they would be able to claw their way back into it. Anything can happen when you get to a game seven. So I was happy to get it over with and now I can relax and just enjoy some of the other hockey games going on. Matt, including your hurricanes versus the Bruins. What do you got to say about that? Canes are going to pull off a miracle comeback. They're down 3-1 right now. But they're going to pull it off. They're going to win tonight. Then they're going to win, uh, I believe it's on Friday. And then they're going to win game seven. They're going to move on. That's a hot take. But, you know, hot takes, we love that on the Poogee Parlay segment presented by Shores Pub Mandarin. And I knew I dropped a video uh, late on Sunday, maybe around 12 or 1 p.m., right before the road course race at Daytona, which turned into a very exciting race outside of the fact that Chase Elliott was so far ahead with a few laps to go. Uh, so Chase Elliott ended up winning there, had called that on the Puji Parlay with Martin Truex, I believe, finishing in third. Uh, but Jimmy Johnson was up there again, someone that I had talked about on the Puji Parlay uh, segment. So definitely watch those videos if you're looking to win money with those top five, top threes. But my guy, Kyle Busch, that I was riding, for him to correct the course, someone that was at the Rolex 24, the most recent driver to have that experience, was in top five with 15 laps to go, and his brakes failed on him, was out of the race with 15 to go. Devastating, fell to the back of the field, ended up finishing 37th, I believe, ruined my fan duel lineups, ruined my sports book for the weekend. That was that. Kyle Busch, I don't know if I can ever rely on you again or your brother, Kurt. Kurt, the only Bush I can rely on from now on is Bush Beer, I guess. So no more Kyle Bush, no more Kurt Bush only Bush beer. But this week coming up, it is Wednesday, like I mentioned. So be on the lookout on Instagram for the uh, Pooji Parlay PGA Tour picks coming up. The playoffs, the FedEx Cup playoffs. Playoffs start tomorrow at the Northern Trust Open up at TPC Boston. This is a tournament that Patrick Reed won last year. We've seen other big name guys win it. Bryson DeChambeau. Uh, you've had other guys in the mix. Tony Finau, Jordan Spieth over the last few years, Dustin Johnson won it three years ago. So this is a tournament where I'm fully expecting uh, the cream to rise to the top. I'm looking at uh, potential guys like Daniel Berger maybe to perform well, Finau to perform well. But there are going to be some sleepers on that Instagram video that I post later on this evening. Definitely look for that tournament starting tomorrow. Get your picks in. Top 125, 124. Vaughn Taylor dropped out. Um, but top 124 players in the world. Uh, in the FedEx Cup standings are playing tomorrow, kicking off the playoffs, and it's anyone's ball game. The format is set up in a way that anyone 1 through 24 can find a way to win the FedEx Cup. So it's exciting. Only three events uh, in the playoffs instead of four like there used to be. This is the first of those three, so go watch that this weekend. We also have more NASCAR coming up uh, this weekend before we return to Daytona in two weeks for the uh, the 400 at Daytona to close out the season on August 29th, I believe it is. So uh, look at that for NASCAR. We'll get you those picks coming up on Friday or Saturday, or maybe I'll push it until Sunday and keep you anxious. And I'm finally kind of getting my swagger back when it comes to the hockey picks. I was struggling a little bit. Wasn't too sure what was going to happen on this neutral ice. The ice skates differently up across the border up there up north. Uh, it's not the same ice as these teams are accustomed to. And that's cliche, but I'm all about hockey cliches. Cycle the puck, pucks on net, pucks in deep, skate. That's a hockey cliche, just skate. We skate it better than them. Uh, and I learned a new one from, I think it was Braden Point. We got some greasy ones in front of the net. So that's like cleaning up the trash. But anyway, I've rambled enough. Magic upset the Milwaukee Bucks in game one of their series to be followed by the Portland Trailblazers, uh, Dame Time, upsetting the Lakers in game one of that series. So both eight seeds won. On the hockey side, the eight seed fell out. The Chicago Blackhawks fell to the Vegas Golden Knights. They're out of the playoffs. But in NBA, 
I'm excited to get a new MBA podcast recorded here in the next few days. Uh, just an update, a follow up, a check in to get you know get you guys some good MBA content based on where things currently stand. But uh, it feels like 95. It feels like 95. Magic going to the finals. Who knows? Uh, they seem to perform well against Milwaukee. So that's all for Pooji Parlay Picks presented by Shores Pub Mandarin. Stick around on Instagram to see the official picks for all of the events going on. That's the spot to do it or Pooji Parlay on Twitter, on Instagram, Pooji Podcast. Definitely be sure to go give those a follow and subscribe to this channel to get notified every time a new episode comes out. But until next time, thanks for tuning in and have a great rest of your week. Be sure to follow our show on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and other podcast streaming services, as well as subscribe to our YouTube channel to check out unique video elements for each interview.